Um, I, I want to start off with a, a little bit of statistics that we've seen India's investments into Africa at about um, 75 billion, that is as 25 uh, rather in 2015, as compared to China, which has about 222 billion, quite a, a very huge difference. My first question is, uh, what do we see uh, India getting from Africa? What does India want to really get in Africa, from Africa? You know, India's, India's relationship with Africa will differ from what China does with Africa. China is a communist country that that can decide at the level of the president and the, and the Politburo what to yeah. do with African countries, dole out the money, create relationships. Whereas India has to go through a parliamentary process of aligning itself in terms of what funds it can draw from the Indian economy and pump into other developing countries. Where India sees its role today is where the big countries used to be developing partner nations of developing countries. India has elevated itself to a middle income country. India is a democratic nation. India feels that its technology, innovation, and the path of progress that it has followed in the last three decades is something that it can share with Africa alongside the money that it can invest or give in grant, aid, or line of credit. So India is going to continue to follow that path. India will not be worried about whether it's $75 billion to $220 billion. And I think, as you saw, Prime Minister Narendra Modi say, and some of us talk about it, during his visit, the relationship with Rwanda, for example, is a strategic one. And this is only second to India's relationship of strategic nature with South Africa. So India is picking its right partners in progress to share prosperity that it has you know, brought in its own country. And that's why these programs. I want to bring in Mukesh. You have uh, built a successful business group of company in Rwanda, but also you had the uh, Rwanda India uh, Business uh, Group Association. Mm -hmm. Help me understand how easy it is for Indian investors to penetrate into this market. No, certainly it is very easy and very smooth, especially if you see the recent years. There are a lot of uh, efforts uh, put in by the government of Rwanda along with RTV. So personally, I can witness like in front of me, there are so many investment companies co coming from India, and then we also get involved in helping them. So what I see like Rwanda has been given a very smooth platform to set their business in. And it's a very easy, a very friendly environment for any business to set up and go further from here. Like if I give the example of my own company, like I'm working for Sadhguru Travel Group as a regional director, I'm proud to say that this company born rightly in Rwanda, right here in Rwanda, and growing across the globe now. So we have now almost 86 plus location across the globe, and the turnover is almost $1 billion. So I would say it's, it's nothing small like to dream big. And Rwanda is really a blessed country. So definitely, yes, it, it is very smooth. Yeah, I want to ask this question now. China has invested massively, billions of dollars in infrastructure, lots of sectors. In this particular case, I want to look at India. Of course, there's this huge difference with which we really have to catch up as India. What are you bringing on the table? I think India's biggest relationship that it brings on the table is, is, is the similarities in which, you know, we work as cultures, people, and yeah. business attitudes. You know, India wants to share, as, as I said, expertise and experience in creating socio-economic impact development that really starts from the bottom of the pyramid population. That means really the far-flung poor people. See, look at India's example. In less than 25 years, India is a very poor country of billion-plus people has thrown up the world's biggest middle class. Can China claim that? No, because it's a communist country. People can't really freely operate that. Whereas in India, the people have elevated themselves to come up. It's a communist country that has managed to take on a relationship, you know, and, 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 and expand its influence across the continent, which has lots of similarities with, uh, with India for the past years. Now we're looking at India reviving this kind of relationship that has been taken on on a massive scale by the Chinese. How do you revive this? What kind of strategy do you bring on the table that is different from the Chinese? You know, for example, skill development. Capacity building. India's mantra for investments or, you know, co-investing with African nations has always been capacity building. They believe that just like Make in India, 
it should be made in Africa, made in Rwanda. And we want to share those experiences with, the, with, with African countries. Today, you see, you talked about China building itself into a very big, large, prosperous, you know, trade surplus nation. Of course, but everything was made in China and sold to the world. Today, China shares very little of its technology with the rest of the world. They want to come and invest. They want to take over the mines. They will take over, you know, building the roads, bridges. In some ways, of course, they help the infrastructure. Would you call this a rival between China and India? Sorry? <laughs> would, you call it a would you call China a rival? You know, I think it's a healthy rivalry. I oh, wouldn't so you, give it the name. you would actually call it a rival? No, it is a healthy okay. rivalry. And why not? You know, I mean, America used to <laughs> rival with, with Japan and, and Germany for markets. So when you see markets across the world, there is a healthy rivalry. I want to bring you in. Yes, you want to bring in something? Yeah, you see, like, uh, when I talk about India and then what you see that what India is bringing to Africa and the other part, it's basically the skill transfer transferring the skills from Indian talent to the African talent. It's not only always the money part. Yes, the money is you put in money, you make money, you take money back to your country, that is one part. But what India's mantra, as rightly said by Mr. Manish, that is a skill transfer. Like we do believe, as India, as country, we do believe that the skill transfer is something which can sustain. It's not necessarily that you need to be there again and again. You keep on going in your path, whatever your uh, the, the, the way you want to do, but once you transfer the skills, definitely you are making the people self-dependent, the country self-dependent. So that's what we believe as the country. Here's the, 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 the question. We've had big investors, Indian investors in, into Africa, name it from Airtel to other massive companies. In your experience, you've done business in South Africa and in Ethiopia, all over Africa. You're doing business in Rwanda. Where are the opportunities in Africa for Indian investors? I think opportunities abound across Africa. Uh, you know, Where but, are they? Which sectors are they? Well, you know, agriculture is for sure. Uh, healthcare is definitely the next one. Uh, IT, ICT is just beginning to boom and bloom in, in, in Africa. And I think Africa stands to have a brilliant opportunity there. Uh, also energy. And Africa is the food, uh, food source for the world. So, you know... When we talk about food processing, this, uh, you know, Africa is considered the food basket. So what we believe is that, just like Mukesh was saying, that if you bring in the technology, share the technology and innovation, pass on the skills, transfer the skills, build local capacity, only then can you create real, tangible, on-the-ground impact development. You wanted to throw in something? Yeah, exactly. The tourism is the industry, I would say, that... Africa is really taking on now. If you see the entire world, and if you look at the global warming, I personally believe, along with my experience and from different uh, uh, views and feedback, that Africa is really going to do very, very well in tourism. So that's the best field. If someone wants to look for the investment in Africa, that's, that is also the one of the best field uh, a person should look into. And definitely, there is another sector which is mining, coming up very, uh, you know, like, speedily that we should look, the investment, uh, someone wants to do investment in Africa, those are the sector apart from what Mr. Munish added, that uh, tourism and mining, in my view, that should be also the sector to well, look into. And uh, with the infrastructure, yes. you know, for example, railways don't really exist as a huge, large, interconnected network. That, that was Africa. actually bringing me to the point that we've seen a lot of uh, investments, especially when it comes to India, uh, in South Africa and, and East Africa. Of course, you haven't penetrated a lot in, in, in Frankfurt, Africa. But we've seen a lot of these investments in retail investments. Are we seeing India going into massive projects like infrastructure or these kind of projects? Yes. India India is investing heavily, even in East Africa. Where are these projects? Which countries are they? And well, are you they? know, all over East Africa, India has done power projects. For example, Heidel Power, which is infrastructure, yeah. solar power. I mean, Rwanda is India's major big partner in the International Solar Alliance. So that's where you'll see a lot of big technology come into, into Rwanda and, and, and East Africa. And as I was going to say that, you know, look, when, 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 when a continent and, and like Africa starts to industrialize, you need to bring in other infrastructure, roads, yeah. railways. Now, the Chinese may have built roads, but the railways are still left behind. India is experimenting with a complete paradigm shift in railways. I mean, yes, China has the bullet trains, but we are, you know, sort of creating our monorail, 
uh, metro rail and a combination of uh, uh, big bullet train, bullet train network. Rwanda Air is an example, beautiful example. I mean, look at this. Within the last couple of years, Rwanda Air has grown to connect, you know, from the heart of Africa throughout Africa. So the opportunities abound, I think. And look at the example of, you know, India has hardly given that play to anybody, but Rwanda Air has the fifth freedom, right, given from India, that Rwanda Air will be flying from, which is already doing, from here to Mumbai, and then India has given it a right to carry passengers from Mumbai to China, China. bring passengers back from China to Mumbai, and then ferry Mumbai to Kigali. India has never done that with hardly, I, I, I don't remember the last time that India Great did that. that have been made, but I, uh, I don't want to make this about China and India, but I want to understand the inference in Africa. Well, 70 billion US dollars vis-a-vis -vis the 222 billion US dollars of China is a lot of money, rather a big difference when it comes to these investments. I just want to understand if we look back, take a step back to the history of India and Africa, we share a lot in common, like for me, independence, you know, um, uh, colonialism and all these things. You would expect some kind of relationship. Let's take back and see where has India got it wrong? Where did India get it wrong to have this massive gap? And where do you think China got it right? Where I think India got it right is in people like Mukesh. <laughs> you know, people... Uh, of where did it get wrong to have that massive gap? I Why do you think China got it right? I think, I think India toiled very hard for about 50, 60 years to get, to pick up its own speed yeah. of growth and development. Remember, India was denied technology by the West. Now China, China focused and, and moved in very quickly into small, you know, small types of manufacturing, as we would say, and today excels in other areas. Whereas India had to really fend for itself in terms of, you know, its, its, its problems political problems, social problems, and financial problems. China had no political and social problems. If you look at the diversity in our yeah. society, similar to Africa, yes. I mean, we have so many issues within the country. I mean, we change governments, we change power, we change. So a country really needs a uniform policy to focus. Now in the last 15 years, Indian government as government, as a country, has decided to focus on Africa. 